as we move along the starboard. As we move along the starboard side, um, my understanding, if I remember correctly, is that there were four tor torpedoes fired by the Japanese battleships into uh, into the starboard side of Akagi that ultimately scuttled the ship and took it took it into the depths. But it had faced heavy fire um, and a lot of actual fires because of uh, fuel lines and munitions that were on on the flight deck um, when the aerial attack came in. And that was a that was a fascinating story. I don't know I don't know if Mike wants to retell that whole thing for viewers who have just come on, but uh, um, but just in this moment of transition, made Akaki especially vulnerable, and and was one of the reasons it it uh, took took so much damage that the Japanese decided it needed to uh, sent, be sent to its end. I, I, I really don't, but <laughs> what I will say is uh, there's actually a really great blog that uh, Megan spearheaded that tells a truncated version of, of the battle. So That's I, right. um, on Nautilus Live, there's a, a blog up there that um, gives you a really good summary of, uh, of the action that, that took place here. Um, that, that I recommend uh, you go take a look at. No, that's a great that's a great resource. Um, we've got outstanding books to read. You got blog posts um, if you're if you're looking for something a little bit quicker. And um, of course, the Nautilus Live website is just a great resource to connect with uh, Ocean Exploration Trust. All of us on board the ship. Um, there's opportunities to schedule live ship to shore interactions. You can learn about the amazing science and internship and. Uh, learning program that, uh, that that OET is running. It's an incredible floating university of sorts, and um, yeah, so great to check out all about the Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition. You can learn about the naming um, of this expedition as well. Some more context behind that. So for our viewers who are just tuning in, um, yeah, some of our archaeologists. <laughs> Archaeologists on board have uh, told the story now over many watches, many times, and so uh, we'll give them a little bit of a break and just point you to the blog. <laughs> so at this point, over many wrecks. Oh yeah, yeah over multiple wrecks. That's right. <laughs> so, quick question about what we're seeing here um, behind the uh, the gun tub. Are are we seeing some uh, uh, some of the superstructure, some of the walls uh, behind it? Uh, not sure what exactly the term would be, but are th have those been buckled or collapsed? Well, my yeah, my guess is that we're seeing uh, flight and hangar deck, uh, either decking or wall that has kind of been torn and, and pulled up. Um, okay. And that's the twisted uh, lattice frame that you see. I think it was the underlying part of the flight deck. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what I was looking yeah. at there. So I wasn't sure of the angle uh, either. For viewers at home, we have um, we have new data points in the and changes to the historical record already happening on board the ship uh, during this dive. We most recently just realizing that the, the shielding that we thought would have been around some of these gun tubs uh, has not been there as we've as we've passed them with Atalanta and and so drawings and, and schematics diagrams being updated in real time as we as we explore this explore this shipwreck together of Akagi. Just getting Bridge to pull us back a little bit more because that that adjustment didn't quite do it. Oh yeah, and John's pointing out that the uh, those round holes or perforations in the metal um, that's that's for saving weight uh, when they when they build these metal structures. That's interesting. Is kind, kind of like how some bricks have like three holes in them, or or cinder blocks have. They said you can build stuff without the weight of it being solid completely solid <laughs> he says he has to redo his drawings <laughs> <laughs> yep throw, throw that book out it's time for a new one <laughs> they changed we changed one detail so were well, those, hopefully a few more <laughs> were those gun ports were they added um during the rest like the second or third so uh, i'm not sure exactly they probably so um Akagi was laid down and built in the 20s, mm -hmm. and then it was refitted between, I think, 35 and 30, 1938. Um, that's when they changed it from the one 
the like two or three flight decks to the one flight deck mm -hmm. with hangers. Um, and so I think they may have rearmed some of it. But then again, the mm -hmm. crews, the uh, casemate guns that we saw below, um, were from its original construction when it was designed as a as a cruiser. So they may not have changed the armament too much. Mm -hmm. So then would there be an advantage when you're moving instead of, because if the original armament was for ships to ship versus mm -hmm. ship to aircraft, could there be an advantage to removing some of the shielding to face that um, new target? I'm, I think that the, uh, the armor bands and the torpedo blisters was something they added in the 40s. I don't think that was mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, I think they were they were dealing with U-boats in the First World War, um, but they, they were, I think that those were modifications they made um, to protect from, from those um, later on. I don't think that was probably part of the cruiser design. Interesting. Initially. Oh, cool. I'll probably be corrected in a minute. <laughs> Virginia, Mike, and those ashore, um, both in Japan and in Maryland, I'm, I'm, and on our science uh, chat team, I'm curious if the biological communities that we've seen so far seem uh, are sort of what we would expect, or if there's been anything unusual um, based on what we've seen. Not a, not a tremendous amount of, of life in terms of biomass, in terms of quantity, but um, some interesting organisms. So, what Virginia, do you have thoughts on that, or anyone else? Uh, anyone else? Want to share thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not a I'm not a shipwreck expert, but I've done some some small research on biological communities adjacent to man-made structures. Um, much shallower, you would expect, a, if if not a colonization, then um, at least organisms using the man-made structure for a refuge or, you know, um, uh, multiple different uses in that way. It's, which is uh, one of the reasons why it's interesting that while there is some biology here, um, there's one of the things that you have to remember is the, the depth, right? And I, I did a, I did a deep, deep research dive recently trying to find information on some of the biology that we could expect. Um, there's Gulf of Mexico shipwrecks that are shallower than these and North Atlantic shipwrecks that I looked into and uh, those often are much shallower and they have an abundance of anemones as well as some corals on them. Um, but due to the shallowness and also the, oh and those were all World War II um, wrecks and mm. and things. So, so I was trying to find similar timelines to kind of get an idea. Um, but actually, one of the closer ones that I could find of uh, depth related was actually the Titanic, because that's 3,800 meters or something, um, and that had a lot of anemones on it and um, a different variety. I think those were like bright orange or something. But these. Mm. Um, the ones we're seeing here are, are, are white. They are smaller. Um, we're seeing a couple of different ones, aren't we? I think we are. I've noticed that some of the stalks have different textures, which right. is really interesting. Yeah, there's some that are a little skinnier than others, too. Right, right. Look more tube-like, almost. Yes. Um, so I'm not entirely positive. I did a, a couple deep dives today, because I also <laughs> was trying to find an anemone deep sea uh, Deep sea ID guide couldn't find one for some reason. So, <laughs> well, um, yeah, we don't we don't come down this way very often. Exactly. I mean, that's There's one, one right the, here. That's one of the, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That deep sea guide lists most anemones at this oh. that look like this as actinaria, which is the larger oh. group of many anemones. Okay. So, mm, okay. Not there, yes. Um, so I actually looked into like some abyssal guides and such to find out more information. Um, and so it's really interesting. There are a lot of different organisms that we could see, but the abyssal plain is is really understudied, um, and it the, really is. the dynamics here aren't well understood. So I was expecting 
to at least see like some fish, maybe shrimp, small crustaceans and things um, taking refuge. And they, they might be inside, but as you can see, there's also, you know, a component of the, the wreck that, um, you know, there's definitely some sort of shelter on the sides as well outside. Um, so as what I was kind of expecting to see at least one side of this uh, vessel with some more abundance than, than we are, so, which is really interesting too. Um, but one thing I've noted, which is interesting as well, is the, the sediment um, mm -hmm. and the, the heterogeneity in the sediment, the, diff, the, the changes that you see, it's not just flat. So that can be really important for informal communities. So there's many different, this is both surprising, but also for people who study the abyssal, the abyssal depths, like this might be more ex as a expected. Um, so so yeah. uh, on the Yorktown, we saw what appeared to be some uh, stocked sponges here and there. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing any, have you noticed any of those on uh, the Akagi? You know, I actually haven't. Um, Same now, here, I haven't seen I any. I haven't been here the whole time. Um, and it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm also noticing on the Akagi, a lot of the anemones are there. They don't seem to be. There was only maybe one spot where it seemed to be attached to the structure, and I can't tell if that's because we were zoomed in, looking at at the name, mm -hmm. and that's why we could see it, the the white anemones, or if actually the these white anemones aren't really on. Um, they're only on a couple points, including like the lines yeah. and the, the gunneries sections. Um, so maybe favoring a certain kind of substrate. Right, and I didn't see them on the top. Yeah. Uh, like where the sort of the flight deck would be. I haven't seen them there. There was, um, which is really interesting. And I think um, we were seeing a similar selectivity uh, with the anemones uh, on the Yorktown as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think we've seen any sponges here, which yeah. Um, I think on your town we did see maybe one or two. Yeah, we saw a few of the the stalks, but then also maybe um, an unstalked as well. So yeah, it's interesting. This seems very similar, but with some slight differences that makes you wonder what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've also seen some mm -hmm. of those free swimming holotherians yes. here too, and a, co mm -hmm. a couple of those. Uh, uh, a couple of those fish that we've been seeing. Right. I, that we're I, not sure what they are. Yeah, I, there's a ch they were swimming similar to how I I feel like um, McCurd swim, but using swimming as your identification tool <laughs> is like <laughs> maybe not the best. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so oh. yeah. Still, it's something worth noting, mm -hmm. but yeah, mm -hmm. it's 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 hard because we can't get the close-ups on those fish mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. the current setup. Right, but it is exciting. It's it's really interesting to think about. Um, this is a rare glimpse into the truly deep part of the ocean. Right, so and this could and be all new. Exactly, you know, and it's also it's not, um, you know, there are. It, it's pretty rare to have. Like I imagine not being a, a, a researcher at these depths, it's somewhat rare to have hard substrate here. So Very. it, I mean, so it would kind of be difficult to to colonize or at least to access, assess it. Um, and the other things I was thinking is that probably, you know, to attract, to attract animals or organisms at abyssal depths, a lot of it has to do with like, um, it's basically smell, mm -hmm. you know, and this doesn't smell like food. Yeah. You know, these are uh, some awesome takeaways and and it is it it is important to remember that part of our objective, although this is an archaeological dive, part of our our dive objectives here are to characterize the biological community, the, the benthic environment, and, and mm -hmm. understand how these shipwrecks are evolving over time and, and, and yeah, how they are or are not attracting life. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. another important takeaway is our deep sea guide gets a one out of 10, <laughs> one out of 10 from Mike. So we need to work on that. No, I don't think that's the fault of the guide itself. I think it's uh, on us for just not really coming down to these depths because it is so challenging to get down here that um, there's just a lot we don't know. Right. And, Super these, and these wrecks are now part of the ecosystem themselves, you know, like uh, some of the shallower uh, artificial reefs that uh, uh, that are in place in, uh, in other parts of the ocean. 
You really have me thinking too, Virginia and, and Val, about the the sensory systems at play here and what attracts. You know, what's gonna what's mm -hmm. gonna sort of uh, trigger colonization or what sort of things are going to be helpful in, in bringing a flow of other creatures into this environment. Of course, some of it might be what people would think of as random, you know, the flow of various currents and other things like that. But uh, are there nearby seamounts or, or populations that can actually um, end up colonizing the shipwreck or not? That actually um, makes me wonder, and this is coming from a non-expert, you know, <laughs> is, is there any sort of role that like this chemosynthetic bacteria that we're seeing forming these rusticles might do to the water column that could potentially bring in life too? You know, is that even a possibility? Yeah, so um, those are three papers that are currently sitting as tabs on my computer right <laughs> now. Ah. <laughs> uh, the, the contribution of shipwrecks, um, and uh, chemosynthetic bacteria uh, that are like, you know, sort of not, I think the rusticles can be formed by some sort of um, bacteria, but then there's also um, sometimes some sulfur. Oh, sulfur reducers? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Um, haven't read the papers, but they are sitting there. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's the first step. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's... Uh, We've been uh, working on a lot of stuff here, so uh, we we'll get the research done when we can. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do not want to know how many so tabs I have open. I did so until yesterday, and now I've, I have very few, I swear. It's <laughs> <laughs> so, more than I should. It's okay, they're not yeah, recording this. <laughs> yeah, with the thickness of the sediment here, which um, we, we can say with a reasonable amount of confidence, uh, many tens of meters thick, we also have no idea what sort of uh, animal life might be uh, might be embedded in the sediments too. Yeah. So there's a lot that again, you know, we keep saying this uh, mm -hmm. on all of our watches. We we don't know what we aren't seeing. Yes, absolutely. Um, it is it is really interesting. Um, and the the substrate, you know, when you move substrate in such a way, sort of like this. You're moving not just the the portion that actually has oxygen in it. You mm -hmm. know, the oxygen only goes a, a certain measure into the seafloor, but then below that, you can have yeah, a denser sub sediment well, formation. So you can expose that, and that Those you know that can have beard? less so. um, you know less less carbon, less oxygen. It, it can be you know which is basically decreasing the food availability in the area. So it, yeah. it's, uh, it's really interesting. I don't think we have an O2 sensor on Atalanta. I think that's on Herc, no. so we don't yeah, have that I reading. Think we do. Oh, we do? Is that a holotherian that we're looking at right there? Is oh. a headless chicken monster? What is that? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, yes. Love it. HCM. That is a HCM's <laughs> technical. That is a Nautilus favorite. That is a Nautilus favorite. So as we were talking about life, Kanaloa heard our call and said, hey, let me show up. Wow. Yeah. One of your favorite forms, and uh, they're pretty spectacular, that's, that's aren't awesome. they? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. They're more rubber. Oh, thank you, thank you yeah. both for kind of diving into that because I think it's uh, it's a, another layer, another part of the Kauna, another mm -hmm. part of the story of the shipwreck is uh, is uh, talking about the life that mm -hmm. uh, is growing, how it's going to be growing, um, what's going to be attracting it, uh, what this shipwreck means to the rest of life on the deep sea, which I know is a hard question. I I love this point that we're, we, we don't know what we can't see, and we do have some sensors on board Atalanta, but we're not sampling like we might if we had Hercules on a shallower dive. So we're, uh, this dive is just imaging only mm -hmm. um, with Atalanta. That's part of the permit um, and part of the dive plan. So um, regardless of whether we were coming down with Atalanta or Atalanta and little Hercules, um, neither of those ROVs are set up to, to be taking any samples. So it would be kind of interesting to have eDNA. We've been talking a lot about eDNA on the sea mounts. It mm. would be interesting to see if what we could characterize or describe based on genetic information in the water column here. But, um, but you know, we're taking what Kanaloa and what Papahanaumokuake are uh, blessing us with or are gifting us with. So uh, it's this incredible imagery of uh, the IGN Akagi uh, Japanese so aircraft that's a, carrier. That's a good yeah. view of the um, mm -hmm. of the seabed. I don't see any evidence of torpedo damage there, so that's helpful. Um, yeah, we can go back up uh, and continue. Maybe I could look over to the side. Oh, you're gonna move forward, or look oh, to I the side. I just look off to the side here. Okay. Yeah. 
This year had a lot of portholes. Yeah, right? Sure does, yeah. <laughs> they, wanted, they had a lot of people over. They wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> How many people were on this ship? Um, I feel like we mentioned that earlier. Hold on. I have it here. You want me to get them to keep us taking us this way? Lateral? Yeah. Okay. I think we're clear of that again now. I think there was something else though up there. Uh, 1,630. Oh, thank you. Is that a hole there? Oh, that could be. Or that could be like the very top of buckling from a torpedo blast. Can we zoom in right there? Zoom in. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a gap in the hull. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like torpedo damage the way that the Yorktown's does, but it could be buckling from, if, if a torpedo struck under that, it could have buckled upon impact uh, because it was weakened. But yeah, I would say that that might be evidence that there is a torpedo strike in that vicinity, but possibly below the mud, mud line. If you're just tuning in, we're on the starboard side of uh, IJ Anakagi, um, Japanese aircraft carrier sunk in the Battle of Midway in Papahanao Mokuakea on the Ala Moana Kaiuli Expedition NA-154 with exploration vessel Nautilus looking for potential torpedo damage uh, along the starboard, starboard hull. Um, it was fired upon by Japanese vessels that were intentionally scuttling uh, the ship uh, after that, after taking severe damage during the battle. And uh, we've been down here for a little over 10 hours now and uh, have a f quite a few hours left to go, continuing to characterize and survey this very sacred and humbling site. We've, uh, we've been hearing the front row from time to time as they uh, help manage operations and move the ROVs into place and but uh, we'd love to we'd love to hear your thoughts as well, front row. If uh, as you kind of process, we know you're doing a lot. All right, so, you come back up? Oh. yep. Yeah, I think I, I can say uh, navigating. It's equal parts awe, um, equal part. Well, I, I'll say a little bit more awe, slightly less frustration as we inch our way around here. <laughs> I feel like navigators always have to have a slight amount of anxiety too. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that iris yeah. issue that's like that's me up here. Catalina manage, manages that anxiety so well, we don't even notice it. Is it uh, flickering on you? Or do you want it? I don't know. I mean, not nearly as well lit as we were. I can go a little over. That's my full iris right there. I can do the auto, but then it gets a little grainy. You want to see what that looks like real quick? It does look weird. Yeah, I think we need to still keep coming up. You come up a little bit more? Yeah. All right. You were hearing the incredible Amber Flynn. She's our video engineer and uh, been so focused on bringing us the best images that we can get from Atalanta and and uh, so thankful to Mike. have a master video engineer up here bringing us all deck? into the depths. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. I think that's the AA gun over there to the left. Yeah. So I think this is the flight deck. We pay attention to what depth we are at. No. So is 
this another gun mount right here? Yeah, I think it's, an, yeah, it's yeah, another we'll gun mount. We should be, yeah, we should, there so should be two more. There should be two more, and I think this is, uh, Nav can tell, this is, uh, is this about where we started? Yeah, we are, very, yeah, actually we just passed it kind of, yeah. but we are much kind of like further out. Yeah, can we get closer? I can ladder over there. Down some more. All right. <coughs> Yeah, that's some of that uh, peeled back uh, flight deck, and I think elevator shaft there. Yep, that's that's a uh, that's the middle air elevator shaft, or midships, um, and then that's the forward gun mount. This is about where we came down. The hole from the uh, from where the smokestack used to be should be just to our right. Okay. So this, this distance kind of away from it is a good one for viewing? Uh, I mean, it's not great. I'd like to be closer if we can, but there are hazards, so I understand. Right, yeah, because we had to kind of back away enough to be able to move alongside. Yeah. Um, let's see. Still. All right, I'll get us to keep inching along here. Bridge nap. Can we move one five meters at bearing two one seven? Yes, thank you. Zach or Val, do do either of you have a uh, have a monitor up with our O2 levels and our and our no, water we temperatures? Don't, we don't have an O2 sensor. Oh, you don't. Okay. Atalanta. Oh, no O2. Gotcha. No O2 on Atalanta. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Okay. We Thanks for a, confirming. We have a sound velo velocity, and yeah, we don't have a Doppler or a oxygen sensor on Atalanta. Thanks, Robert. So Virginia, um, I think you're seeing these two. Are, these, are those jellies in the water column that we're seeing here and there? The little white specks? Yeah, I see one fish near the center of the screen, but sometimes when we bob up, we're seeing something that looks possibly like a jelly. I'm having trouble making out detail. Yes, I too am having trouble making out detail. Okay. Um, there are many things at this depth that could be traveling along in the in the, in the currents and the um, could be could be jellies, uh, nadarians. Could be tinafores. Um, mm -hmm. There's. Um, it would be pure speculation by me to guess, though. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, gotcha. <laughs> I, okay. I have I seen like a rat tail or two, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. 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 It's deep. Yeah. Well, they are. They they are. They can go very deep. Yeah. Um, there's clearly. also. Uh, um, it doesn't look exactly the same, but there are snailfish. And those the, that was mm. reported. I think that's the deepest vertebrate or deepest fish reported. Okay. Was a snailfish. So. I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So actually, on that subject, I was wondering. So this is the deepest dive Atalanta has ever done. I don't know what the deepest dive Argus has ever done, but I'm wondering if this is the deepest dive that Nautilus has ever done. Like, total. No idea. No, I know. I know. Yeah. I don't Stand by for confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Hey, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we, we're just elevating that question to the chief. <laughs> <laughs> like, Rennie would know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rennie would, uh, would know. know. Rennie would know. That's, uh, that's an answer to every, every question <laughs> we're, we're asked almost. Yeah. Rennie would know. I used we to love know you, Rennie. I like that, but I've been away for too long.
Mike, are we about uh, right off the beam, kind of uh, midway up the starboard side of, of the vessel now? Yeah, we're, we're like um, just after where the tower is on the other side. Yep. And we're just after where the smokestack used to be, which I, so we should see the hole from that. Uh, Almost a full forward. circle, huh? No, we've done a full circle, yeah. We have, yeah. Yep. Okay. We're going to go a little bit, well, we're going to go most of the way, continue this, do this again, because I want to look down a couple more times on the, uh, to look on the torpedo damage. Um, but then we're going to, like, at the bow, we're going to go over onto the deck and run, like, up the midline of the ship to look at the, uh, the damage. I mean, because that's really where most of the, the battle damage is. That we aerial really battle got, damage. We haven't a good look at that yet. Great. And fire damage. Thank you. Zach or Amber, do you guys have a moment to share some of your reflections on the, you know, seeing IG Anakagi for being part of the team to see this for the first time, part of the group of viewers uh, around the world to see this for the first time? What's it been like for you? Well, it's just been a, a, a just really a, a treasure to be able to see this and to be involved in, in this um, expedition. And um, so grateful for you know our team ashore and here that have really just illuminated what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, I'm just humbled by this experience. <laughs> That's right, as we all are. It's been amazing. Zach, how about you? Um, it, it's pretty surreal seeing all this for the first time. Even um, work town was pretty surreal for me. And, you know, it's, to me, I'm kind of like in a, in a haze thinking like, you know, is it real, is it not real? Because, you know, it's, it's pretty unbelievable that we're able to do this and, you know, have a team to be able to experience this with as well. That's right. We do experience it together. That's, uh, that's a big part of the learning and Important to remember that this war was experienced together by people at home, not just the men on board these ships, but uh, their families back home. The community in Hawaii, I know, was forever changed by the war in the Pacific. Uh, so many communities around the world forever changed by this time in our history. And it's just such an honor to, uh, to think about the ways that, that we've been able to come together since that time to make sure that these these kinds of conflicts and tragedies don't repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. Most definitely, Dan, and you know, numerous nations, entities, and communities um, around the globe are represented through this project, this expedition, um, Ala Omwana Kai Uli on board the exploration vessel Nautilus. So it is It is just to echo what some of our other cr crew members have said, that it's very surreal. Do you want to try coming down a little bit right here? We haven't really gone very far. Yeah, I got him to keep us pull moving along. Mike, what are some what are some comparisons, kind of just basic level comparisons you could make to what we're seeing between this and the Yorktown in terms of ships that have been down for 80, 80 plus years and um, kind of what differences in what we've seen in, in terms of battle damage, differences in design, um, differences in kind of colonization, the, the biological community, how it's settled on the bottom, those kinds of things. and. Do you think it would change much if, like, if we were coming back in 20 years' time, would these would these shipwrecks look very different from what they look like today? I don't think so. I mean, the big difference is that the the, the major damage that this one sustained um, on the flight deck. So Yorktown only had that one um, hole that we saw on the flight deck, and uh, it, its construction was very different. You know, it had the much larger uh, island that included the smokestack. Um, guns are different. Uh, the, the hangar decks are very different. The, the Yorktown had the roll-up doors and the hangar windows. This one doesn't have that at all. Um, 
And yeah, the re the Yorktown is listing quite hard to, to starboard. This one is pretty on a, on a pretty even keel. Um, I don't think they'll look that different in 20 years, you know, like 100 years, 100, you know, 200 years, yeah, but uh, 10 years, probably not. Or, you know, yeah, that's your Yeah, 10 or 20. Yeah. How, how is the our Douglas fir deck going to fare down at these depths? Does it feel like that might actually be able to be pretty well preserved because of well, the temperatures? If it's, still, if it's still there now, uh, that means that the organisms that eat that stuff aren't going to get at it. So that could be the last thing standing, honestly. Oh, wow. The corrosion might take some of the metal structure. The before. I mean, eventually the corrosion, I mean, it might be 500, 1,000 years, but eventually the corrosion will collapse everything yeah um, I mean that's just how metals gonna go no matter what yeah you know you, you might you might and people have talked about various things to like preserve Titanic or whatever but I mean no matter what you do like a, a steel hull is going to become a pile of rust at yeah. some point in the future that's right. um, you know and that I, it's, it's part of the life cycle of a shipwreck and uh, I, th I think that we might for Yorktown we might have a in a thousand years we might have a pile of rust on a bunch of uh, of those uh, boards. A or, beautiful or Douglas fir Douglas forest fir down forest. there at the bottom. Um, because I don't, like, the wood's not going to deteriorate on its own. Yeah. And I don't think the stuff that consumes it is going to uh, find it down here. So. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And, you know, it's on top, so it might actually be visible <laughs> forever until it gets subducted somewhere. That's incredible. Now, how does the corrosion compare between the two vessels based on your initial yeah. observations? Does it feel like this one's uh, suffering from, from, because of the amount of battle damage, does it appear to What's be that? corroding more quickly? No, they seem about the same. I mean, th there's rusticles on both. Um, honestly, they're not really that, that badly corroded. Um, the USS Saratoga is a lot worse because I think that the nuke uh, that from Test Baker at Bikini Atoll, um, I think it had um, micro fractures from that in, that blast, and so that one's collapsing because it's just cor the w seawater can get into that uh, into all those spaces uh, yeah. and, and corrode it. But th th these are similar to other World War II wrecks I've seen. Uh, not seeing anything. Pr the, the I'll take that back. The th the stuff on Yorktown the, at the flight or the uh, co the conning tower, not conning tower, the just the stack. Where it was all it had been burned and it was like all like looked melted and white was really strange. Yeah. So that's the one thing that that's I. That's what we first came down on, yeah, when we yeah. first first landed on Yorktown a couple of days ago. Thank you for that. Thanks for that. Answered a lot of viewers' questions, a lot of my questions, and okay. uh, thank you. It's a quick note. I think I'm seeing a little bit more sedimentation on some of the level surfaces of the wreck here, but I'm not totally sure. Oh, that's interesting. So it's it's uh, like that uh, that uh, uh, gun tub that we just passed. It yeah. was a little lighter in color than I would normally expect, and I think I'm seeing some of that uh, up near the top of the screen too. Well, this is a little deeper, so it's possible that sediment flows down this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm also kind of thinking of what might have happened during impact too, because that would yeah. have brought up a huge cloud of uh, uh, dust and yep. yeah, depending on currents, you know, I'm trying to figure out where that might have settled. Right. Are we seeing another buckle on the left, or is this just a weird mud line? No, it is a buckle. That's a good, good Ooh, observation. Good spot. I'm not, it's possible that similarly, this whole uh, underside of the hull on the starboard side is weakened, and upon sinking, it kind of crumpled. Um, but I don't like that's not torpedo damage, you know. I think it's just it's buckling of the hull plates, which may just because of weakened structure from the torpedo strikes. Right. Okay. Right. Torpedoes set to be pretty deep, like. Do they go off under the ship? Like? I mean, I'm not sure. They, they for sure went off under the water line. That's about all I can say. Mm -hmm. uh, Calling another move just to keep it going. Well, Bridge. Like Is that, that damage that right a, there? Is that a hole right there? Oh, yeah. Oh, what's going on here? Wow. That's what we're looking for. We'll come down a little bit more. Oh, definitely. Amber, can we zoom in? Wow. Silver Spring, are you are you guys still on the line? 
I think uh, I think John had to sign off for the night because it's well, three thirty in the morning there. <laughs> yeah, he, he wasn't at Silver Spring. Yeah. We're on. Yeah, ECC is here and uh, you know keeping up steam, and certainly want to thank John over the air for just the incredible opportunity it's given us to to dig deeper in, in ways that we certainly couldn't have done without him. Thank you, John. I feel like this whole thing is on a plate. Yeah. Appreciate everyone being with us uh, over on the East Coast late into the night. Um, and all the scientists on shore. Thank you guys for continuing to help us tell this story. We're looking at uh, some of the torpedo damage that struck the Akagi from other Japanese vessels as it was being scuttled and sent to the seafloor to rest here. It seems to be a favorite hangout of the headless chicken monsters, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is apparently a, a, uh, a good environment for them. They seem to be thriving here. All right, so we're somewhere kind of a uh, midsection along the side of the ship, correct? So we've passed a couple of the circular gun tubs now. Yeah. Yeah, we've passed the last one of those. Okay. This, well, that's interesting. This is just below the smokestack, so that could be one of the reasons why it's missing, if the torpedo actually blew it off. Yeah. Um, okay. So that would be in a debris field. That could be in the, in the debris field, but if the ship kited at all, it would be somewhere else. So when we found Nevada, the... The damage of the, like the bow and the stern and like and and some of the superstructure was blown off by the ordnance that the ships that were scuttling it fired at it, and then the actual hull was I think like 600 meters away from that because bows will still cut through water when they're sinking. Um, so I don't know if we'd find the smokestack in the uh, debris field, but it is possible. Yeah, so I'm, that has me wondering what things look like a little further up the hole now. Yeah. Where it might have been sitting. Would a torpedo hit like this might uh, kind of take those superstructures on, on a decks above and just collapse them? or No, how, how would that typically. work? No, not um, typically. I mean, in Yorktown, you just, so the torpedo goes in and then blows and makes a bubble and then that explodes outward. Um, and so you typically see a, um, plating buck, uh, pushed outward. Okay. And so we're not, you know, the, it really is a device to, to flood a ship. It's not really a device to um, damage other parts unless it were to hit, um, you know, a magazine of, of ordnance or something. Um, right. I don't see that here. I think it might be a plate that fell away after a torpedo strike and that the actual torpedo explosion is, is below. Is below, yeah, in the under the sediment line. I mean, and that would make sense because this sediment, this mud line is above the water line. So if a torpedo detonated uh, below the water line, I wouldn't expect to see the actual explosion point here. But that, that sort of explosion from inside or pushing out would then weaken those structures above. The plating might more easily come off as it sank yeah. or, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Is there, a, is there like a science to scuttling ships? You know, you see demolitions of buildings that can be like managed quite precisely or in the, in the context of war, is it just kind of hit it with hit it with enough that you know it's going to go down. Yeah, I mean, I think in the context of war, it's that because they're not over there calculating trajectories and, and you know, ounces of explosive. I think they're just like, sink it, yeah. you know. But uh, modern day carriers that are often sunk intentionally, that's that's done a, a bit more managed uh, kind of formula. 
Yeah, but you can also put explosives along the keel, and that's just going to sink anything. Yeah. You know, this this was putting in torpedoes from a distance by destroyers, so the precision uh, isn't isn't quite there. That makes sense. Still worked, but one torpedo might have done it had right, they hit the back. exact spot they wanted. Yep. You know. When we're alongside on the beam of, of the starboard side, you get such a beautiful sonar image of uh, just looking at that on our quad cam, camera number three. It's uh, and the the image that uh, Catalina, our navigators and pilots are using, and just coming in so clearly. See the ship alongside Atalanta. Folks in Hawaii that are watching, maybe getting ready to go to bed on a Sunday evening so they can wake up on Monday morning, head to school, head to work. Folks on the East Coast would be, uh, if you're still watching with us, wow, thank you. And uh, you're staying up through the night. And, uh, same with our West Coast friends. But we have viewers spanning all the time zones, all the time zones around the world watching, tuning into Nautilus Live joining us on this exploration to see IJN Akagi for the first time. It's been seen by side scanner. It's been seen from sonar, but it's the first time we have eyes on Akagi since My World Zoom's War II. doing a little mind of its own trick right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it just oh keeps no. going. It's getting, oh no. it's getting wacky too. Oh, it's I'm been sorry. a long it's been working hard. It's been working and hard. And then you go out and it just keeps coming. <laughs> so uh, sorry to make everybody nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're okay back here, but uh yeah, sorry. Okay. All right, uh, I gotta go out, it's Robert. It's, it's not behaving. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, I had reported that er earlier, so yeah. we'll mm -hmm. have to look into that. Yeah, sometimes the equipment has a mind of its own. Yeah. Kukui, if, if you have a minute, um, you know, we haven't gotten to hear much from you because you've been so busy um, logging this, but can you give us an idea of, as the data logger uh, on this archaeological mission, what are, what are you trying to do? What's, what does it feel like your kuleana, your job is? Yeah, uh, hiki no. Um, so we're just trying to type in um, everything that we hear, um, all the observations that are being made from scientists on board, scientists on shore, and also trying to take a lot of still captures or still pictures. And um, eventually this will be used for photogrammetry, am I correct? Uh, we, we, so if we do it, it'll be done um, with the video actually, um, not, not the stills. Uh, we'll we'll definitely do it for the the stack uh, from and the the island from Yorktown. I'm not sure that th we might be able to do it for the stern or the bow of this boat of this ship, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you really kind of need to get like really comprehensive coverage, which we did for the stack in Yorktown, just because we were sitting there looking at it for so long. Um, this one has been a little bit more. It's a little, the, the water just seems a little bit less clear and, uh, and our maneuvering hasn't been quite as um, easy on it. It's just been kind of, uh, there's been more hazards so we've had to like pull off more. So it's, it's harder to get that full comprehensive coverage, but we'll probably give it a shot anyway. A tougher wreck to model, but Kukui's over there doing a great job. Thousands of images, catalog to uh, just typing away. Yeah. Um, if you do hear some of that, uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, the mighty kukui. <laughs> the mighty kukui. <laughs> you can sometimes hear just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> as she starts oh, no, typing so like super fast. No, 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 it's great. Yep. You're just She's so fast. It's incredible. <laughs> well, these keyboards are also like super deep keys. So it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> but they're wonderful mechanical keyboards. I'm a fan. <laughs> I prefer the uh, very like. Thin keyboards. This is like tap 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 instead of chung 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 chung. Everyone's got their preferences. Oh, definitely. Oh. Um. 
It's a good question. Could it could be part of a support or a filing cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, they had to file papers on <laughs> aircraft carriers. It looks too big to be a filing cabinet. <laughs> wow. You can see a ladder off the, the yeah. right. Yeah. Who gets a fridge? <laughs> <laughs> Again, similar to Yorktown, some of these features, um, smaller features on board the on board the wreck, help us kind of scale it, you know, uh, help us see kind of how humans would fit onto this massive, this massive aircraft carrier, um, how they measure up to the size of this, uh, to this vessel helps, helps tell the story of bringing it back to life. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to get a sense of scale in these images too, until you find something like a door that we can, uh, that we can use as a reference in the image. So it's, it's, it's a big ship. In? All right, zooming with caution. I've got a little more if we wanted to go in more, Robert. I like your abbreviation. Mike, what do you suppose this object is resting on? Which object? The filing cabinet? Or any, yeah, the filing cabinet. Um, <laughs> I think it's on the, um, it's like on part of the hangar deck or the edge of the hangar deck. Uh, that's, that's, that's where people would access these gun tubs from. I'm not sure if that's the hangar deck or not, but there's like a, a, a an outer, surface that uh, these guns are mounted to. I think it's like this ladder is accessing that. I'm not sure what it is, um, but it, it's some sort of support, I think, from from the deck above. I was wondering if it could be uh, a surviving piece of the stack. Remember, it protrudes from the side of the vessel. Um, maybe. I think, I don't think we're quite over there yet, though, because there's a gun still, a gun tub still over here. Okay. But I could be wrong. I'm not sure. Um, like portholes inside of it. Maybe it's a bit. What? Who's talking? Oops. My bad. Oh, Mike, yeah. Mike was away from Ronald. Uh, um, there's like little holes on the side of it. Maybe it was a vent once upon a time. Yeah, that could have, as uh, John was explaining earlier, that could have just been for to keep weight down. Um, because these had like three flight decks originally, they they were very top heavy, so they would punch holes in the in the steel uh, supports to to keep them lighter. You see that in some like aircraft wings, like aluminum uh, aircraft construction will have like holes in the like in yeah. intentional holes in the structures. Especially because these started out as a different kind of ship. Yeah. Oh, sure. Do you suspect that it was some kind of uh, storage container? Yeah, for files. No, I, I really don't. <laughs> no. No, I think it, I think it was just part of the uh, supports. Okay. Are those, actually, you know what? I might. From the schematic, this looks like it could have been what sat underneath the stack there. Yeah, I'm just as I look at that, I I completely changed my mind and think Russ might be onto something because I think there's a hole to our right under the flight deck, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that might be where. Th I don't know the. The stack was really big. Can we zoom out? Okay, come up. Oh, sorry, Robert. I just kind of jumped a gun there. Oh, that's bizarre. That's like curved, isn't it? It kind of looks like it, doesn't it? Is that the top of the stack? And then part of it broke off here? 
That was like a connection from it? Yeah, I think that might be the top of the stack actually. And it's just the bot the second part broke off. Um, hmm. Okay. Because it's supposed to be this wide flat metal structure. Um, I don't know why it's perforated, but I wonder if that's what we're looking at. And then th this stuff is just the vents inside and, and like the, the part that stuck over broke off. I don't know, it's, it's so big I can't like, I can't get a full sense of it. Russ, what do you think? Well, it looks like this may have yeah. once been covered with something. Go ahead, Russ. Now, it's just a bit hard at this point from, from this perspective, but I yeah. thought when we were on the side of the vessel, it almost looked like there was an, an opening, you know, underneath. There was something protruding out towards us, yeah. and it looked like there was a, a, an opening underneath. And it just hit me that, that the uh, the stack was actually, you know, the, the exhaust gases were directed out the side of the vessel, not out the top, like right. you would typically see. Yeah, I mean, that is where we are. We're in the area that the stack was in. And I'm, I'm just not, like, this part here is curved if we look up. Um, and I'm wondering if this is, like, the, the top part of the stack that then, like, the connection to it broke off. Or it could just be flight deck that's warped. Bob, can you look to the left, please, a little bit? I just lateral went over that way. Yeah. You want to come down some? Yep. That's what I'm doing right now. I feel bad for anybody who had a porthole underneath a stack because they just get like clouds of black smoke out, out their window all the time. <laughs> that's yeah, that's not pleasant. Down. Yeah. We're going to get out of the light here. Can we actually go back up? A little bit? Okay. How about here? Well, I was actually trying to look at the stuff that was above that. Um, oh. I'm looking at the angle of the, uh, the, the deck plating there that, to see if that's flight deck or if it's the smokestack. Okay. Fascinating, <clears throat> fascinating puzzle. Has been the whole dive. Uh. Or maybe as we continue to the to lateral to the right, I'll see the, the joinery of it um, as we get to the other side. All right. I can give us a little jump, uh, 15 meters that way. Which way? 15 meter, just keep continuing yeah. down. Well, Russ, I think either way, you're right that this is the, the, op the hole from where the smokestack was.
Thank you to all of our viewers tuning in on Nautilus Live and on YouTube. This is Daniel Kinzer, Science Communication Fellow. We are on the IJN Akagi, a Japanese aircraft carrier uh, sunk at the Battle of Midway early June 1942, over 80 years ago. And uh, this is the fourth dive of the Ala Moana Kaiuli expedition. NA-154 for exploration vessel Nautilus into Papahanaumokuakea, sacred waters, Waoakua, Ainaakua, realm of ancestors and of Kanaloa to the Hawaiian people, and also the resting place of many vessels from World War II. Just a couple days ago, we had the humbling privilege of descending on USS Yorktown, just over 5,100 meters, and today we're on one of the Japanese vessels. Now friends, American and Japanese friends, Hawaiian friends, collaborators from around the world joining together for this exploration and storytelling to honor this history and, and to look forward together and continue to tell this evolving Mo'olilo story. jumbled mess up here. Mm -hmm. I was looking at that hole down the, to the left. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little hard to get a sense of, you know, what happened to all of this here. Yeah, it's this is um this is a bit of a mess. Um I think it might be because of uh the smokestack breaking off. Okay. Yeah, it just looks like parts of it have been just torn straight off. Yeah. coming down here and see what's going on. Yeah, that be that would be good. Let's go down. That metal beam right there. Yeah. Um. You want to stop right here? I feel like we'll swing into it eventually. I can, I can pull us back that way a little ways. Okay. Ooh, big heave. Mm -hmm. As Atalanta, Atalanta drops down to the sediment line, you can see so many of the decks and this particular part of the ship along the starboard beam mangled badly during the fires, during the battle at Midway. It's like some warping in the in the hull there. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. see that. Mm-hmm. And it looks like there's a hole to the right. It does, yeah. There's definitely something missing there. Yeah. Now this, are we looking below the waterline here? No. Still, wow. 
Yeah, such an impressive, such an impressive ship. Yeah, so, so tall off the water. And uh... well, actually, that might be the waterline right below those portholes. So like mm -hmm. the very, very like last meter of above the waterline, which would be why there's a different color there. But I think we have another torpedo strike. In to the, the top, right. In the top right, yeah. you can see some paneling that's come off and. Don't let Val see any of the rocks. <laughs> There's, Those aren't rocks. It's all, it's all chunks know. of sediment. It's yeah. the muck. It's the pelagic sedimentation. I know. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. getting <laughs> pretty close. Yeah. yeah, and the well, the pelagic sediment. What I was seeing in some of the uh, stuff I was looking up earlier, it there are like different layers of like clay, softer sediments, You're silts, lateral out. carbonates. Get away from it. So that's why we're probably seeing some of that stuff that's forming chunks is that it could be a slightly more competent layer that's been uh, churned up by the impact of this uh, ship as it sank, hit bottom. Yeah, right. bring it up there. Yep. Ooh. ROV pilots. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Bob and Zach working. Uh, extraordinarily well and carefully together, bringing us one of the closest views we've had of the side of the vessel. <laughs> yeah, and we're actually able to see inside, inside from this angle. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Can't forget the bridge and our master navigator either. Thank you guys for, and our amazing video engineer getting us those shots. Kind of seeing where we settle here to get a good bearing to move forward. Wow. You want to try to see if we can look in there, Rob? You what? You want to try to see if we can look in there? What just uh, with Sam or? <laughs> oh wait, you're doing a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Don't scare Amber like that. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Coming this close um, sort of transports me through time. You know, 81 years back in time to to this uh, such a more intimate becomes a bit more sacred, a bit more profound to. Um, mm -hmm feel almost invited on board by this masterful ROV piloting and engineering and navigating. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's one thing so haunting to see it in the distance, but then also just uh, starts getting emotional as we, as we uh, come to this uh, severely damaged part of the ship. Mm -hmm. It's like it broke right there, huh? Yeah, buckle. Big yeah, this is definitely... Like split. Yeah, it's very catastrophic damage eerie and you know it does stir up a lot of emotions too so it does <clears throat> bridge now We move one five meters at bearing two one zero. Thank you. As someone who cherishes the, the place and the people of Japan so much, having been given the privilege to travel through that, through those islands uh, multiple times, take my own family there, make so many friends there. It's. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to make of this, but it's um, often hard to look back on this time of conflict, this time of tragedy, this time of war globally, but it's it's also so makes me so hopeful seeing now how how much joy that place has given me and the mm -hmm. deep connections we have with the Japanese community in Hawaii. Yeah, it's um, definitely. Yeah, and I hope that we're able to help bring some form of closure to some of the families who've been affected by this, been touched by this. I'm sure many uh, 
There's many people whose fathers, whose, whose brothers, whose uncles, whose grandfathers. Um, I hope this can, this can help honor them um, in a way mm -hmm. that, that supports those families. Very much so. We are uh, coming up on just under an hour left with the amazing 8 to 12 watch team uh, who really enjoys spending our time with all of you. So we do get to enjoy another hour and it's likely that, uh, I, think, I think that means we have about eight hours left on bottom. So still quite a lot of time left. Hopefully some of you will stay up with us. Some new viewers will tune in and and um, continue to uh, enjoy this humbling exploration of IJ Anakagi. Please send in your questions, your comments, your stories um, on the chat on Nautilus Live. Let us know how this is impacting you. Let us know what it makes you curious about. And uh, we appreciate that. The next watches will appreciate that as well. Amazing to be a part of uh, history in the making and remaking as part of this dive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, these dives have permitted us to learn some new details about the Yorktown and uh, uh, a lot of details about uh, the Akagi now, and it's uh, it's changing. It's it's uh, made it clear to some of our archaeology team that uh, uh, it's it's time to update the uh, the books, and the, uh, the and uh, diagrams of uh, damage that uh, are more consistent with what we're seeing right now. Always exciting to see uh, the record updated in real yep. time with new evidence, um, the historical process, the archaeological process, mm -hmm. seeing it in action, just like seeing the science in action. It's, yeah, this uh, is how it all progresses forward. Um, you know, we have to do this with science too. We can have one interpretation of something that we're studying, but then down the road, there may be a new way, like a, a new type of data to collect or more data. And that can change the interpretation, and we have to go back and revisit what we originally thought, and um, you know, update that uh, uh, based on the story that uh, the data or the observations are telling us. Mm -hmm. Mahalo, Dr. Val. Thank you so much. I actually have an Olalo no a Hawaiian proverb: "Ikova ma mua, ikova ma hope," and this literally translated. Um, as in the time before and in the time after. This Olalona Eau, Hawaiian proverb, tells us that the future is in the past, or that learning from the past can guide the future. We have a very similar saying in geology. Um, studying the past informs the present, and understanding the present informs the future. Beautiful. So there's a, there's, there's a wonderful par parallel there. Mm -hmm. Such an important sentiment in, in voyaging. Um, we know that on every voyage, uh, mm -hmm. to safely return home, we need to know where we come from. We need yeah. to know where we are so that we can know where we're going. It's the only way to pull new islands from the sea and, mm -hmm. and still find our way back to family, find the way back across the oceans and into the depths is also true. Mm -hmm. Back in time is also true. So. Really uh, important Mike. sentiment, beautiful idea. Um, so as we make our way towards the um, towards the bow, I know we don't want to go yep. all the way there, but yep. just for like an angle, it does taper off again. It's going to yep. get, okay. Yep. Well, when, um, when it starts to do that, we can kind of come up, I think, and go on top. So we want to, okay. well, yeah. You would just continue down like maybe 15 meters more, and then we can come up and go on top. Yeah, that'll yeah. work. Okay. 
fridge now. Can we please move one five meters at bearing two zero zero? Thank you. Last night up on deck hey guys, here on real, the real quick, Val and I are gonna go off comms for a sec. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank uh -huh. you, Val. Last night, several of us were talking about the significance of the of the flag, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, were reminded by a viewer of the beautiful rising sun that was painted onto the deck, the flight deck of the IJN Akagi, and can wow. see it in uh, images and and also in recreations of the vessel. My understanding is there's very little left of the flight deck due to damage from fire and battle damage. Um, certainly not likely that we would see any remaining evidence of that um, that sort of iconic mm -hmm. red circle um, that still still represents Japan to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, really, really kind of beautiful image and a great reminder of Great reminder of what we might have seen if we were looking down on the flight deck, um, you know, from the sky 82 years ago, 81 yeah. years ago. You know, and that just also speaks to like greater symbolism uh, to a nation, to a people, to a culture, to their language, the kauna of that, uh, the deeper meaning of that. I mean, we see that within our Hai Hawaii, our Hawaiian flag. Um, there's a story, there's a mo'olalo uh, behind every nation's flag. Um, there are ways that, you know, even till this day, that that is a source of pride for people. Um, pride for that nation's people. Um, it's how we identify and connect. Yeah, that's right. Mahina, mahalo. Some viewers are curious, those who have just tuned in um, to this dive on the IJN Akagi are, are wondering what are some of those changes that we were talking about that have been made to the historical and archeological record. And um, one of those is uh, that uh, in many of the diagrams, many of the uh, models uh, of the Akagi, there was shielding around many of our gun tubs, um, anti-aircraft gun tubs and others. and um, we have not seen evidence of that shielding um, as we've made our way as we've made our way around the vessel. Um, earlier, we also uh, Akagi revealed its uh, it to mm -hmm. itself to us, its name to us yes. um, on the on the stern on the port mm -hmm. and starboard sides. We could see some evidence, but it was on the starboard side that the mm -hmm. um, that the characters came through Akagi. Uh, read from right to left, as you would read in Japanese, and it was, uh, yeah, they were unsure of uh, mm -hmm. how the name was represented on the ship, and um, and in fact, those were those had been painted over yeah. and, uh, before the ship was sunk, before it was scuttled, um, but we could see some of those characters coming through um, that paint after 81 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a pretty profound moment. Uh, mm -hmm being in, introduced um, to the vessel in that way. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the other key things to remember is that this actually, if I'm remembering correctly, this had not been imaged. There, this had not been, um, the site actually, there was no image evidence except in us um, through a side scan sonar. Um, so, that's there right. were soundings, but there was no actual physical identification through mm -hmm. images of this video, per, for instance. And so it's uh, pretty, pretty amazing to be a part of the team that is having this colla very collaborative team. Mm -hmm. This, you know, it, it's uh, across countries, you know, multiple continents, different. Um, nations and people from all over um, different universities and institutes and such have come together to work at the effort to video this and this uh, you know we're using the ROV tow sled 
Atalanta, which is our not not the ROV that we usually use, and so it's it's pretty astounding. Co-expedition leader called it third string. We don't repeat <laughs> that when Atalanta can hear, but uh, yeah. yeah, called it third string well, ROV. I think, you know, we were all looking forward to using our stereo camera set up for mm. the first mm. time on Little Herc. And, uh, mm. I don't know if they have video from when we uh, a couple months ago when we looked at a uh, a plane wreck off of Honolulu. Oh wow! It's uh, using uh, it's Unreal Engine Five video game technology to recreate like a 3D environment where you can after action like fly around the plane wreck and zoom in and uh, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. It's one of my uh, one of my favorite conversations. I frequently talk with Jonathan Feely about some of the, the producer, one of, part of the production team and communications team for Ocean Exploration Trust and He's so excited as well, just as you can hear. Yeah, uh, Bob. Sure he's pretty disappointed we didn't get to get in here, but you know, the cruise after the next one, after this one, <laughs> is a technology demonstrator where we're going to go out and use that exclusively to, to yeah. stretch its legs and see how that works <laughs> out. There, there's more excitement ahead, I know, and uh, yeah. Robert and, and many others are, are somewhat disappointed, but I think we're also amazed at how well Atalanta has done. Um, we know this isn't uh, the absolute best that's possible, but we know that it's the absolute best that's possible right now. Right. And uh, that's, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the best, one of the most, of, you know, one of the most things that we've learned is just that we can get here, we can do this as a team, and I think that's really, and that it takes a team. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Absolutely, Virginia talks about uh, this is the first time IGN is being seen by cameras, by human eyes, has been seen by side scanning so sonar from AUVs, has been seen from sonars from ships. Um, there have been multiple attempts made. Um, yeah, are you going there? Uh, to try to get down, bring an ROV down and, and image this vessel. And this is the first uh, successful attempt um, on IJ and Akagi. And so a lot is, uh, a lot of data. Um, you know, we've already seen things that are changing the historical record, but it's likely that thanks to Kukui and the work of our other data loggers and the team on board, the archeologists ashore, scientists ashore, um, that record's gonna be more comprehensively updated uh, just uh, because we we now can go back and study um, some of those narratives, we can sort of start to align them to what we see in the imagery mm -hmm. um, captured by Atalanta, and that's uh, it's a rich learning process. This is, as we keep saying, the Kai Uli is such mm -hmm. an amazing library yeah. of knowledge, especially when you enter it together with friends and with aloha and respect, mm -hmm. um, can reveal what are so we much. Looking at here, what is this thing? We don't have Mike on board, but I. Um, if any of our Silver Springs colleagues are still awake, I hope not actually, I hope you guys are getting some sleep, but if you're still awake, you're welcome to jump in. Awake, but we're not going to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Come down some? Yeah. We have uh, we have one viewer excited to see the deep sea in his virtual or his or her virtual reality headset or their virtual <laughs> reality headset. Yeah. After listening to you, Bob, I know I I was able to show the team a little bit of the video game like environments that I've been working on in collaboration with Ocean Exploration Trust and mm -hmm. uh, bringing the Nautilus to life in extended reality and some of our deep sea environments and creatures as well. That was a really fun project. Is that on our website? Not yet, not yet. It hasn't uh, hasn't passed full inspection yet. Uh, you got to be Coast Guard certified and uh, Megan Cook approved, expedition leader <laughs> approved. But uh, I hope one day it gets up there. It's had uh, several hundred viewers already, and I've been teaching classes on board the XR Nautilus wow. virtually for the past few months. So it's been that's quite a lot of fun to bring young Hawaiians onto mm -hmm. the on board the ship. And, oh, and that's, uh, that's stuff on the ship. 
What about the video from the, or the, the 3D from the... Yeah, the underwater thing. footage. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on that too. They're bringing, uh, building some of those portals as well, uh, putting them into various uh, VR platforms, testing it out. At that uh, that kind of technology is pretty cutting edge, and certainly for the deep sea, Ocean Exploration Trust is leading the way. So uh, I'm excited to see what we can build. As part of my role as a science communication fellow, uh, I get to continue working on creating these kinds of products, learning products, and support of uh, OET's mission and Nautilus's exploration. So. I get to turn uh, Bob the adventurer, the deep sea adventurer's uh, world mm -hmm. into uh, a world that all young kids hopefully will be, have access to here in ways that are fun and engaging, so. Okay, we are back. Cool. Yep. Uh-oh, right. the bosses are back. How right. are we doing? <laughs> we are, <laughs> we're beginning the move uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're wondering what we're looking at, Mike. Perfect. To get back up on top of the okay, middle. Great. Yeah, yep. I'm also wondering what you're looking at. <laughs> Looks like some kind of controller if there was a, um, like a running light. Yeah, is that a running light? Oh, wow, a running light. Really? Mike's uh, Mike's uh, back off his headset, so you're not hearing from Mike, but uh, or Hans. They're they're just handing over watch for for a moment, Silver Spring. But uh, what's that? Could, it. could be. That? Yeah. It, it, it looks like the uh, U.S. or it looks like one of those running lights that we have on our ship, but they can't really get the black lens on the other side. I'm not sure we quite caught that Silver Spring. You sound a little far from your mic. I'm, I'm sorry. It, it kind of looks like a, a ship's running light. Okay. Yeah, it does. It looks it looks a bit like a, a light. All right. Thank you, Silver Spring. That was uh, that was for Bob Waters. I'm sure you guys know Bob and Bob. We're looking at a probably Robert. looking at a running light. And Bob, you've got the internet very excited to see uh, the deep sea in, in uh, virtual reality, extended reality. They're they're ready to they're ready to sign up. Might want to run away with that product. You'd probably make millions. This move I put in somehow, instead of translating us across the deck, is kind of taking us yeah. down along it. Let's see if it comes, swings back over. Oh, are we still moving parallel? Yeah. Okay. But I, we had set it at a bearing to take us basically perpendicular onto the deck. So we'll see gotcha. what happens. Is there a bit of a current down there? That's what I'm wondering because uh, it seems like when they were down here um, earlier in the day, they ha I don't know, it's almost like they had gotten swung in or something. Yeah, I've been trying to gauge by what the marine snow is doing, but it's not always clear. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, not always the most reliable down, indicator. It's hard, to, hard to figure it out sometimes. Right. The up and down is a lot faster than the side. Mm-hmm. Was, was this on the bow or is that um, It's probably beyond. Just right? beyond it, I think, yeah. It's, I think, yeah, that might be the end of it right up there. So Nautilus, this is Silver Spring again. I think, spring. That we, I think that we're in pretty good shape right now in terms of having assessed for torpedo damage. Yeah. What is your all sense of the next step? What's most important for us, 
moving after this is going to be uh, going over the flight deck and looking at the elevator. Um, I we'll, believe we'll have to check with uh, Mike here once he's back on uh, SPL. He's he's just uh, uh, briefing Hans right now, but. Um, and I, think, I know he has a plan laid out. Yeah, that had been the idea, so we can we can make that next move once we uh, just confirm. But yeah, that was their idea right. was to head back up that way. Yeah, I think missions are aligned, Silver Spring. I think that that uh, we'll confirm with Mike and Hans once they have a chance to connect. But that that's what Mike was saying earlier was after we made this point over over to the middle of the deck, we would mm -hmm. start heading down the ship, the midline. No, that's good. Yeah, this is Jim. Tell him like I'm I'm about ready to do that myself. Right. Yeah. I can probably go ahead and it put it. It strikes me as the most meaningful thing left for us to do. Yeah, because they already got pretty good view of the Great. front end anyway. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Silver Spring. I'm gonna go ahead and okay. call it to the bridge. Bridge now. Yeah. Oh. Is that Can good? we move three zero meters at bearing zero five zero? Thank you. Were you able to hear me? It's a little bit low. I'm working on getting your level up. Great, thanks. Okay, I should be good there. Thank you. Robert, from your perspective as the ROV pilot, what's been, uh, what's one of the more challenging things associated with this dive? Uh, yeah, the challenge is some of the things that are sticking out into the water column. Like, uh, yeah. There's a lot of overhangs. That's always hard to deal with, especially when the visibility isn't that great. A lot of coordination with the navigator uh, required to keep us keep us safe. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo, everyone. One thing we don't have to worry about here is fishing gear, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And we've had the vehicles caught up in fishing gear a couple times. Mm. Do you just use the manipulator arms to try and pull it off? Uh, we've had the, the, the long line get in the middle of the tether between Ooh. the vehicles. and. Yeah, I had to oh, bring no. it all up and collect it on deck. I ended up with a six-foot high pile of fishing line. Oof. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah. That's a mess. That's pretty stinky. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, that would be, wouldn't it? Especially if it's been hanging out in the water column yeah, for a while. it's got all kinds of things on it. Oh, no. <laughs> Catalina and Robert, are we just traveling now down the midline of the of yeah. what would have been the flight deck? Correct. Yeah, Nautilus is making its way that way, and we're just going to wait for Atalanta to catch up. Awesome. One of the things that I think you know will be interesting in that, in terms of the flight deck, is looking at the difference in areas where the fire we burned, where deck this. off came up. We're also of course, very interested in that point near midships where Dick Best hit that deck with his bomb and started that chain reaction of explosions and 
and fire down there in the hangar deck, which of course then burned for such a long time. That that fatal blow uh, may very well be yeah. reflected in an exceptionally uh, you know high amount of damage. I and then oh, and oh, looking oh. Well, that was me. Important. My bad. And, and Jim, is that on. is that uh, likely sort of uh, 50 to 80 meters further? Yeah. Further towards the stern. The um, the damage from the front was more midships, not a bit midships. Just off the center line, midships. So. Roger. Hey Jim, this is Mike. What end are you guys driving back towards? Are you heading back towards the bow? We're at the bow. We're heading towards the stern. We're, so we're almost sitting okay. on top of the, the bow there. Yeah. The yeah. Hey, Jim. Jim, this is Mike. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm I'm passing it over to Hans. I'm gonna uh, get some rest for a few hours, and I'll probably come back towards uh, uh, with a couple hours left to go. So um, just uh, he'll he'll be here. Uh, he he knows the plan. Basically, the plan is to do this line in the uh, midline to uh, to the stern. Take a look at the elevator shafts and the the collapse of the uh, the decks. Uh, and then and then go out to the debris field and poke around there. Um, well, that sounds good. I think you know for us, the uh, that that's that's really important. The other thing is that that area where that fatal hit took place on the flight deck. Yeah, yeah. Hoping hoping yep. that we can um, once we pass the stack, yep. it should be ne just past that next elevator shaft. Yes. Roger. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, just uh, check in with Hans if there's anything that you, anything else that you want to um, look at. Uh, I'll probably. We'd like to look down on the. Uh, we'd like to look down on the island stack. Area. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. I'm also thinking of a grande <laughs> For those who are just tuning in with us um, here on the fourth dive of Ala Amoana Kaiuli Expedition in Papahanaumokuakea, we are sitting just above the bow, looking towards the stern on the flight deck of the IJ Anakagi. Um, Japanese aircraft carrier that was sunk as part of the Battle of Midway. Um, and uh, we're about to pass over uh, this upper deck along the center line, looking at uh, various battle damage from that uh, historic battle. Uh, we are 5,330 meters deep, uh, over three miles three miles below the surface. And the crew on Nautilus here in the control van up on the bridge throughout the ship is uh, working closely with our navigator, our ROV pilots, our video engineer, our science team, communications team to bring this first ever. Uh, this is the first time Akagi has been seen since the ship was sunk 81 years ago. Um, so first ever view of this shipwreck uh, to the world, including an amazing team of archaeologists and scientists on shore at NOAA's Ocean Exploration Command Center, and um, also Japanese colleagues, uh, marine archaeologist experts, friends of many of the crew and, and co their American colleagues working together to uh, survey this shipwreck um, and rewriting history. And the, it's happening happening now. I'm discovering new things out about Akaki and 
confirming other things and expanding the story, bringing this mo'olelo, bringing this um, this experience uh, back to life for us to honor and remember uh, those who served and, and now rest in the waters of Papahanaumokuakea. Thank you for joining us. You can send in your questions. Uh, you can send in your comments, your stories online on Nautilus Live. We are uh, just above the flight deck near the bow. Many viewers have noted that yes, this is a place where the flight deck has folded over. It's heavy damage. Large fire broke out on the deck of the ship. The, the wood that would have been there is now almost completely burned, stripped away. And uh, we'll be looking at some of the places where where bombs hit uh, during that tragic battle 81 years ago. Hans, it's great to welcome you back into the control van. I hope you had uh, Hans as my awesome roommate. <clears throat> we have the party cabin. <laughs> the party cabin. It's uh, it's good to have him back and um, appreciate learning with you, Hans. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? I know they've viewers are probably familiar with you if they've been tuning into the Yorktown dive or this dive. But uh, now that you're back, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, my friend. I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So right now you're looking at a portion of the flight deck that we'll be uh, surveying and uh, uh, logging uh, battle damage on can imagine this in action that uh, I think likely would have been covered in aircraft. There also would have been aircraft on the level, the hangar level below. Um, there would have been anti-aircraft fire, a, a stack that's largely, largely missing now mm -hmm. um, due to battle damage. But uh, we've uh, made a full pass around uh, the perimeter of the entire vessel. It's over 800 feet long. Um, couple hundred feet wide. I'm not exactly sure of the dimensions. I don't have them in front of me, but uh, it's a massive, massive vessel. Um, and we made a pass all around the perimeter, looking at the flight deck level and the hangar level, all the way down to the sediment. Most of sediment line is mostly above the water line, although we did find a few patches that uh, where, where below the water line was exposed. We also um, we're gifted with the opportunity to see, uh, to have the name of the ship uh, confirmed and revealed to us, uh, mm -hmm. seeing seeing uh, Akagi, uh, that was on the starboard side. Which along had been the stern. painted over. Had been painted over. But, we're, and white but it was blocks. still embossed into the hull, so we could pick up the shadows in it with uh, Atalanta's lighting. I just can't just imagine a more incredible. appropriate way to see the name is the shadows just barely revealing themselves and, and mm -hmm. us relying on our Japanese colleagues and those fluent in Japanese to be able to help mm -hmm. identify and translate that for all of our viewers. And that was a real privilege and a real honor to uh, to be listening in just a little bit earlier on this dive towards the beginning parts of our four hour long watch, which is coming coming to a close here in about 20, 25 minutes. So dimensions on the Akagi, uh, the length is 260.67 meters or 855 feet and three inches. The beam, 31.32 meters or 102 feet, nine inches. Uh, the draft, 8.71 meters or 28 feet, seven inches. Yeah, and most of that draft submerged in uh, <clears throat> very old muck or pelagic sedimentation, as our geologist, <laughs> geologist yes. will call it. So. Which is, we, we believe, uh, fairly thick around here based on extrapolations from uh, some uh, data acquired in uh, some other 
somewhat nearby portions of the Pacific Abyssal Plain. So several tens of meters thick at least. And so would we had recognize the painted letters of the vessel's name? Um, it was, I know we had another viewer asking and I have some of my own thoughts and questions, but did we ever, it was painted over prior to scuttling. So as the crewmates were evacuating in the last moments of the ship, was, there were orders given by the ship's authority to paint over and then the significance of the letters being covered. No, that probably would have been done before the ship sailed um, for the operation. They wouldn't be doing that after the ship was hit, no. Done most likely at the start of the operation to obscure the identity. Right. Thank you for that. Awesome. <clears throat> Mahalo, thank you. So Hi, Nav. I'm glad to be back to reorient myself. We're moving aft. Are we over, do you believe, the forward elevator? Or are we there yet? Or are we just looking at massive damage in the deck and we're still forward of the, of the forward elevator? I, th I think based on the schematic, it's just some the damage that you were mentioning because it look, we haven't moved, I don't think, far enough yet. Roger, thank you. And since we can do it, can we uh, peer 45 degrees to the right and then back on course? Just spin the, the uh, ROV. Wow. What are we looking at there again, Hans? Is that uh, part of the missing stack or, in, or, I, or I, island? Or Yeah, I don't think we're, we're down at that point yet. We're still forward of that. It's just a folded over uh, deck. Folded deck, okay. side, yeah. This is badly damaged uh, flight deck and hangar deck. Yep. We're still forward. We're, we're, look, to the we're looking into the upper hangar, I believe. You're on yeah. mute. The hangars would have been mostly space, you know, I mean, the planes and all the materials and we're in there and if, if they're not there, it's a large cavernous space. Thanks for that front row. No offense to your usual usual watch, Hans, but uh, this is the best front row there is. So, yeah, is We're all entitled to our opinions, my friend. <laughs> but right now, I'd agree with you. <laughs> oh, not much, uh, not much competition on board this ship. It's all about collaboration, unless we're unless we're uh, playing Uno. Uh, yeah. Things can get a little dicey. But, yeah, Uno, uh, Uno is very serious business around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've changed the rules and they've made it far more complex, and it, it's it's ruthless. It's hard to lose, isn't it? I'm sorry, Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all that Kukui kept sweeping it the other night. There is no, oh, yeah. there's no defeating Kukui. That's. Uh, <laughs> That is our light, that is our yeah. depth of knowledge, is just a uh, master of so many things, including Uno. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all you folks. <laughs> yeah. oh. As always, it is a total honor and privilege to be on board with you all and to be on watch and to be witnessing, bearing witness to this historical expedition and to have even a small part feels like uh, more of an honor than I deserve, so thank you all. And I have to uh, 
echo some of Zach's words from earlier about how surreal an experience this is too. Well, it's a little haunting, frankly. It is. I mean, there's a lot of historical information here and archeological information that fills in a lot of gaps in the, in the narrative and our understanding of how these things change on the seafloor over time. But some of these images are ghostly and this is, uh, this is mm -hmm. somewhat haunting as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a legacy that, you know, we need to learn from and kind of keep, keep with us hopefully bring to the rest of the world in a way that, you know, makes things better. Remember some of the darker things in our past so that we don't repeat them. Something hanging over here. Yeah, shore side, I'm looking at more of what looks like a manufactured firmer edge. I'm wondering if we're down towards the forward edge of the elevator. Do you think we're that far aft yet, Jim? Yeah, I believe so, Hans. We've seen this wheel before, if I recollect, or we've seen one that look, looks like it. That's right. So I think that I think we're that that looks like a rounded corner. It does. Yeah. So again, you know, I think we've seen this, and I think it's elevator. This is most definitely eerie to witness, but it conjures up a lot of different emotions, mixed emotions for everyone. And it does, hopefully, it helps us uh, to move forward and understand with more empathy um, to fill in those voids with um, information from these expeditions. I remember in the span of just a couple of weeks visiting our um, Pearl Harbor Memorial at home in Honolulu on Oahu. Can zoom on that, please? And also visiting the Hiroshima Peace Memorial in Japan and just being, uh, having such a profound impact on me and understanding the atrocities of war, the bravery of war, the, Thank just you. the complexity of that conflict and of the forgiveness that has to follow. Hey, you're a little quiet to me, Robert. Is the mic close? Can you zoom out? Yeah, thank you. And that's full out. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, that's full out. Is the zoom still kind yeah. of on a mind of its own? It does. <laughs> okay. Whip that zoom into shape, Amber. I think it just needs a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. So we are uh, looking down in the forward elevator here um, on the top deck. So we pass down the, the center line of the vessel from bow to stern. very haunting to look into what mm -hmm. feels like the guts of the ship, especially in low light, especially so deep in the ocean in this yeah. realm of Kanaloa. This realm of pole is what we consider as eternal darkness. Um, so it is, you know, the very deepest parts of our ocean and the depths of the Kanakoevi universe, the Hawaiian universe. It's where we come from and where we return to. So many stories there that just can't be known while we while we live in Ao, while we live in consciousness, and mm -hmm. and uh, so many stories that even with the most advanced technology, even with the greatest exploration team I've ever been a part of, mm -hmm. there are still so many stories that just won't be known, cannot be known. Right, I'm gonna keep us moving along. Yeah. Bridge now. <clears throat> Can we?
we please move two zero meters at bearing zero three five? Thank you. Hans or Silver Spring, or if there are, if, if any of our Japanese friends and colleagues happen to happen to still be on the line, I'm I'm sorry for having to continue to ask, but I'm uh, it's getting late. Uh, I need more coffee, but. Uh, is the damage we're witnessing here at this forward elevator, is this associated with the bomb strike or was this uh, played out during the fires or is it something different? This is not the bomb strike. The, the bomb strike would be at the midship's elevator, which would be just aft of the island. Thank you for that so reminder. The, Next elevator that we come yeah. across. So that. I think that is part of that deck right there, right around the uh, um, So we're looking into the forward elevator as well. Yeah, I think we're doing that, and I, I think we may be seeing the, the, the deck of the upper hangar and into the lower hangar through the elevator opening. You see that, Jim? So we're looking now into the lower hangar as well. What a huge space was, was in there. Yeah. That's a good question about the bomb strike. You know, that was further aft. It was a thousand pound bomb that began to ignite the, the fuel and the torpedoes and the ordnance. And without the side hangar doors, as with the Yorktown then, the blasts of those induced explosions must have been a tremendous force. And the fires and that force of induced explosions then really seem to have opened this thing up. I can't imagine what it must have been like, frankly. Just the thought with all those fires burning at, at the hangar level and the guys trapped down below in the engineering space. It's just realizing that you're not you're just not going to make it Hans, i was thinking a bit about that you know when i did my first dive on titanic and we were there aft at the stern and the engineering spaces and those guys stayed they didn't get up they didn't get out they stayed they kept marshalling as much steam as they could to keep the dynamos working to keep the lights on so that they could send the, uh, the wireless message. And uh, none of those engineers survived. And I think, you know, where we were earlier this morning, you know, today, back aft at the stern with that hatch open where these guys would have gone down there to try to free up that, that rudder. Again, recognize you may be able to help save the ship if they they could, but they would not survive. And that's why we're here to honor honor that bravery, no matter no matter where you are in the world, to to face uh, to face imminent death, to uh, do everything you can to save the lives of your crew, to save the lives of of your best friends, of your community. We um. On board the Hokulea, our traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe, where we've only lost at sea one crew member, legendary Uncle Eddie Aikau, lifeguard and waterman, and and on that on that plaque on Hokulea, so that Uncle Eddie is always sailing with us. We it reads the same. Well, there's no there's no greater gift, no greater sacrifice than to give your life to save yeah. your friends. So we lift up all those, all those.